Broken report from the BBC with Michael Burke. Thousands of racegoers are stranded in Liverpool tonight after a terrorist security alert forced the Grand National to be cancelled. Police are still searching entry for bombs. There have been several controlled explosions. And trust me, not the others. The politician's slogan this election weekend. Good evening. The Grand National, the world's most famous steeplechase and one of Britain's great sporting events, was called off half an hour before it was due to start this afternoon because of a security alert. Two bomb threats were made by callers who used the IRA's code words. All 60,000 people at Aintree were evacuated as bomb disposal teams began a series of controlled explosions. It's not thought they found any terrorist devices so far. The operation is still going on. Nobody is being allowed back to get their vehicles and thousands are said to be stranded in Liverpool for the night. Aintree was packed. 60,000 people crowded in for the world's most famous horse race. The mood was one of anticipation and excitement as the runners paraded round the ring. Then came the first sign something was wrong. BBC Sport was live. So, although there's an awful lot of uh, people around the ring, they wouldn't be aware of what's going on elsewhere on the race course. And I do believe that uh, uh, other things are happening there. In fact, they are evacuating the county stand. There's been some sort of uh, alert. It was half an hour to race time, but the Tannoys were announcing an evacuation. Please evacuate the whole race course and make your way to the centre course and coach park areas. The crowds were good-humoured, there was no panic, and they were ushered across the course and away from the buildings. There have been two coded bomb warnings received by the, the police, and there is no possibility of taking any chances. Consequently, we're going to abandon racing for today and make a further announcement later. So I just ask everybody here, including you from the BBC, to leave the course and get out onto the public highway immediately. As the events unfolded, confusion turned to dismay. Got a great feeling of disappointment, an empty feeling here at Aintree. People who have come here to see the greatest steeplechase in the world, the paddock. There it is. You'd think it was a cold Monday two day, two weeks ago, completely deserted and the 38 runners have been evacuated and a picture that uh, speaks for itself a deserted weighing room the horses which had been in the last stages of preparation were led away jockeys who'd been getting ready to mount up crowded round with trainers and owners unable to take in what had happened we were just about to put our hats on in the weighing room we were, you know the, we were a couple of minutes to be being called out so uh, we were ready to roll Disappointing, terrible mess. Unbelievable. I mean, it makes the fiasco of three years ago pale into insignificance, doesn't it? Absolutely right. Richard, what happened to you? Where were you? Desmond, just the same, came in from, from the last race. I was just about to, walk, or had weighed out, given my saddle out, gone back in, just about to get tied up, and um, we were told to vacate the weighing room. That we were outside the weighing room, then we were, we were told to move up here, so it's, no, it's a disaster. Yeah. It's very worrying for the, for the horses and everything. Horses tacked up, and I've just spoke to Mr. Bailey, now he's taking the saddle off. Um, We'll have to wait and see. Well, it's disgraceful, isn't it? It's so disappointing for so many people. All the time and effort that's gone into today, it's the biggest race in the world. Um, it's very upsetting for everybody. An emotional Jenny Pittman, twice a Grand National winning trainer, with two horses due to run, was in tears. I'm afraid these people are very sick. If you could have just seen the scenes down the stable yard, where we've had to leave our horses. Yeah. Know. You know, they just said, you've got to leave your horses, get out of here. Right. So and I just find it, anybody, anybody that could be involved in such a disgusting act is just unbelievable. No one was sure what would happen about the race, but as the crowds milled around the course, the fences were being damaged. Military experts began searching for bombs, a huge task in the debris left by the racegoers. Just 29 minutes after the Grand National should have started, they found a suspect package and made the first of several controlled explosions. 
Merseyside police gave further details at a news conference. Uh, there have been three controlled explosions uh, within the race course. But what I can say that the packages that were subject to those controlled explosions at this moment in time are thought to be innocent. Aintree officials hope the race can be run on Monday, but a final decision has yet to be taken. Jackie Rowley, BBC News. Local schools, sports centres and church halls around Aintree are offering emergency accommodation tonight to racegoers stranded by the security alert. As bomb disposal experts continued to search the track, thousands of people were unable to return to their cars and coaches inside the security cordon. Our sports correspondent Kevin Geary reports from Aintree. When the alert originally went up, it had been all rather light-hearted. Nobody in the crowd was taking it too seriously, and it took increasingly urgent demands from the police to get people to move at all. Even when we'd all been corralled in the centre of the course, it was a time to display pluck rather than panic, as the Gurkha Pipe Band was persuaded to strike up. But then news spread that racing had been abandoned. The Grand National, the focus of 70,000 people hoping for a great day out, would not be run. Everyone had to get out, but even then the mood was one of just sad resignation. Well, I'm terribly sorry for everybody who's come here for a day out, and uh, I'm particularly sad for the owners of the horses who prepared them for this one day, and uh, they're all here and ready to run. I think it's uh, very, very sad indeed. It was while the crowds milled into the surrounding streets that an announcement was made that no vehicles would be allowed to leave until tomorrow. Thousands who'd come by car and coach were stranded, many a long way from home, among them some 500 totes betting employees. Well, we're stranded to be quite honest. We've got um, nowhere to no stay tonight. No accommodation, no taxis, no nothing. Won't let, us on, won't let us on the coast to get our cars till tomorrow. We've got absolutely nowhere to go. There's no accommodation whatsoever. We're stuck here, we've got no form of transport. It's been an absolute nightmare. It's been absolutely terrible, the whole thing for us. How are you going to spend tonight? We're a pub. Train station, maybe. What's happened here hasn't just ruined what should have been a marvellous occasion, it's also caused misery and hardship on an enormous scale. And with several other major sporting events due over the next few weeks, the fear is that it could happen again. Tonight, the misery was continuing for thousands, with Liverpool's health services on full alert to deal with those left roaming the streets on a cold, windy night. Many are being provided with temporary accommodation around the city's docks. Our next step is to set up some emergency shelters on the Kingsdock car park, where we will be able to house the people who are coming in here to the Albert Dock. That is a temporary measure until we can bus people out to local leisure centres, sports centres and schools, where they will be accommodated overnight before they can go and collect their transport again tomorrow. What started out as a fun day at the races has ended up leading to a long, uncomfortable night on a cold, strange floor. Kevin Geary, BBC News, Liverpool. The main political parties have all condemned the IRA's disruption of the Grand National and the recent spate of bomb alerts. Today we've seen a quite cynical and absolutely determined attempt by the IRA, for I'm sure it was them, to wreck a sporting event that's enjoyed by millions of people, both in this country and right around the world. This is a stupid, futile and idiotic policy that will achieve absolutely nothing except make people in Britain more angry and more determined to make sure that there's no action the IRA can take which will either disturb the process of the election or give them any chance of participating in the peace process. I cannot understand the mentality of those who act in this way. Yes, they've got great publicity and millions of people know what they've done. There cannot be one single person among those millions who do not feel disgust, contempt and anger at the way in which the IRA have behaved. And I think what must unite us all is determination they're not going to win. Today's alert follows a series of bombs and coded warnings over the last two weeks which have brought chaos to many parts of the country. The IRA appears to be trying to cause maximum disruption in the run-up to the general election. Uh, Ireland correspondent Dennis Murray reports. Chaos and disruption on the motorways in the Midlands this week, a classic IRA tactic. Main arterial routes in the heart of England strangled, with millions of pounds lost to business. But there was a real bomb here. That means that all bomb scares have to be treated as seriously as the threat at entry was taken today. Last week, another attack on the transport system. Bombs on the railway line at Wilmslow. And while there were no injuries in either attack, the IRA achieved what it would see as tactical success, maximum impact for minimum effort. 
the IRA has carried out attacks in England since the early 1970s for the same reasons then as now. It believes that such attacks get the attention of the British public and government in a way that any number of incidents in Northern Ireland do not. As to the effect on the peace process, the main nationalist party was scathing. This is a cynical action and a risk-free way of causing chaos. But Republicans, if they did do this today, should realise this makes far more difficult the task of this government or the next government or any of us when it comes to believing what they say when they stage their press conferences and talk of peace. A Sinn Féin statement tonight used familiar language. It said that if armed actions were to be brought to an end, then a credible process of inclusive negotiations was required. All this is time to coincide with the election campaign, a reminder from the IRA of its presence in England. The group may regard the tactics as working, but questions still remain over what long-term strategy they're intended to further. A united Ireland's no closer, and certainly Sinn Féin's entry to talks is no more likely. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. The emergency services say there are no reports of casualties among the racegoers at Aintree, but they've issued a phone number for people concerned about friends and relatives. It's 0151 494 2421. That's 0151 494 2421. The day's election campaign has been dominated by arguments over which political party deserves the trust of the voters. The Conservatives claimed Tony Blair was untrustworthy because he'd changed his mind on three policies in as many days. Labour accused the Conservatives of breaking their promises on tax and the NHS. Our political editor Robin Oakley reports. Whoever rules the roost politically on May the 1st will have to have earned the people's trust. Still pursuing Mr Blair with the chicken they sent after him last week, the Tories today said Labour's leader didn't deserve the voters' trust. By backing a Scottish Parliament with tax-raising powers, and then saying Labour, if in control, wouldn't let it raise taxes, he was trying to have it both ways. Tony Blair is a classic example of someone who gives whatever the audience wants to hear the preeminence of his sound bites on the day. The difficulty he faces, he's got two audiences. He's got the audience in Scotland, and he's got an audience in the rest of the United Kingdom. And those two audiences want to hear two different things. And Tony Blair has been caught with his mouth open, but two different voices coming out of it. Mr. Heseltine injected a new and sharper tone into the electoral battle with his personal assault on Mr. Blair, who was out campaigning in the northeast today with his father. But Labour argue their leader has shown by his renovation job on their party that he keeps his promises, in contrast to the government's record on tax. He's happy to make it an election about who'll keep the faith. Yes, this election is about trust. It is absolutely, fundamentally about trust. And after their record of the past few years, I don't believe the British people will ever trust this Conservative Party or this Conservative leadership again. Out and about in the West Country, the Liberal Democrats leader also took up the theme of trust comparing voters to motorists being asked to buy a fifth car from the same garage after losing money on the last four. The last model we've had these last four years has quite literally fallen apart. Most people who went to Honest John's five years ago feel, I think, totally let down. The issue which the Tories hope won't be returning to dog them is that of sleaze. But with ex-minister Neil Hamilton, accused in the Cash for Questions affair, due to face his adoption meeting on Tuesday, a growing number of local Tories are calling for him to quit. His local party's treasurer today urged him to stand down. I think provided that we can force through a secret ballot at the adoption meeting, there is every prospect that the members will realise by Tuesday how serious the situation is and that there will be a clear majority of people voting not to adopt him as the candidate for Tam. The campaign looks like getting much rougher over the week ahead. In a newspaper interview tomorrow, the Prime Minister accuses Mr Blair of squirming and slithering to avoid questions. He describes new Labour as control freaks who don't trust people to make their own decisions. Labour respond that the Prime Minister, who used to say he wanted the debate raised above personal abuse, is cracking under the pressure of the campaign. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster.
European finance ministers meeting in the Dutch town of Noordvijk have agreed that application for membership of the single currency should be assessed at a special summit next spring. As holders of the EU presidency in the first half of next year, Britain would normally have hosted the summit. But the BBC has learned that the meeting will now be held in Brussels. Our Europe business correspondent Jonathan Charles reports from Noordvijk. Strong winds lash the Dutch coast, an unseasonal welcome for EU finance ministers attempting to restore momentum to the single currency project. Assembling for the traditional family photograph, ministers were determined to show the 1999 start date was still achievable. During talks, they agreed that countries will now be assessed for membership at a special summit in late April or early May next year. Only by keeping to the timetable can monetary union begin on schedule. The date of uh, 1st January of 1999, it is inside the treaty, and if we want to change this date, we have to change the treaty. During the meeting, it emerged that next year's special summit won't be held in London as had been assumed previously. The British have the presidency of the EU for the first six months of 1998 and were expected to provide a venue. Now it will take place in Brussels. Every British presidency I've ever known has held all its meetings in Brussels or Luxembourg, and this will be one of those. In Nordvek, the summit plan is seen as sensible in light of the wait-and-see policy on British single currency membership adopted by both the Conservatives and Labour. Only the Liberal Democrats sound slightly more enthusiastic. Holding the summit in Brussels would allow the single currency to be launched in the very heart of the EU. It would also save any future British government the embarrassment of having to stage a party for a project it may not be joining. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Nordvek. The American poet Allen Ginsberg has died of liver cancer at the age of 70. Ginsberg's work made him the preeminent poet of the beat generation in America in the 1950s and 60s. He'd been ill for some time. Here, 70,000 bottles of an anti-allergy drug given to children and adults have been recalled. The instructions mistakenly recommend too high a dosage. The makers of Fenagon Alexia say the high dosage could lead to drowsiness. Items which carry the number LOT 7B357 should be returned to pharmacists. Duncan Kennedy reports. Pharmacists have spent the day clearing the 100 milliliter packages of Fenagon Alexia. The printing errors involve a batch of a Now, uh, ICM's poll in tomorrow's Observer puts Labour on 48, the Tories on 33, their best in ICM since November, and the Liberal Democrats on 14. ICM's adjusted figures nearly always put the Tories higher than the others do. NOP in the Sunday Times, interviewing on Thursday, the day of the Labour manifesto, put Labour on 52, the Conservatives 28, and the Liberal Democrats on 12. And Morrie for the Independent on Sunday and the Sunday Mirror have Labour on 55, the Conservatives 30, and the Liberal Democrats as low as 9 over here. Morrie is the most recent, interviewing yesterday, but before the full impact of the row over Labour's plans for Scotland. And that's the Liberal Democrats' lowest showing in any poll since the last election. So, the campaign so far. Now, here is uh, up the top here, Labour's uh, position in the 13 polls since Mr Major called the election, 50% or more in all but two of them. And the red shading here now shows Labour's range at each period, and the party's average showing is pretty strong all the way. Just a slight move down there, but on the whole, pretty steady. But way up the top. The Tories, within a point or two of 30 throughout the whole two and a half weeks. You can see this clearly when we highlight their range there. And on average, no movement at all for the Tories. The Liberal Democrats down the bottom, never higher than 14, except in this uh, ICM poll here uh, earlier this week. But that poll, which the Tories also rather enjoyed, incidentally, is now clearly seen to be out of line with the rest, which doesn't, of course, necessarily make it wrong. Now, there's the Lib Dems range and their average, pretty flat all the way along, uh, as you can see with that little blip up there with ICM, which now looks as if it's uh, slightly out of line. The referendum party, incidentally, showing as high as 3% in two of the polls at the end of this week. So, bearing in mind that at the last election, the Conservatives had a lead of 8% in the share of the vote, we now have Labour leads tonight going the other way, 15% in ICM, 24% in NOP, and 25% in Mori. Remember, the polls were 8% out in the gap between the parties last time, but even if those leads were 8% less, Labour would still be way ahead. 
It all amounts to a Labour swing of between 11 and 16% from 1992. Enough to devastate the Tories if that did happen on election day. So, let me introduce you to the BBC's battleground. 120 seats the Tories are defending, scattered all over the country, all blue last time. The higher the column of blue, the higher their Tory majorities in 1992. It's, if you like, a kind of staircase that the opposition have to climb. Down here on the bottom left, the easiest ones for them to turn red for Labour, gold for Liberal Democrats, and yellow for the Scottish Nationalists. And Labour need to get this far, at least halfway up this third column, 57 net gains as far as where Loughborough's mark there on our battleground and beyond to win an overall majority. And just to illustrate the apparent strength that Labour have now, if you believe the polls, this is what would happen if people voted on May the 1st exactly as they're telling the pollsters they will right now. Not just one, two or three columns opposition gains, but right the way across, and we've even had to add another 120 odd seats to accommodate the number of Tory seats that would fall if there was a swing anything like this. It would be a Labour landslide. And a close regional reading of the polls makes it look even grimmer for the Tories. The big Gallup 9000 survey for the whole of March suggests that the swing to Labour since the last election is greater the further south you go. Swings of 10 or 12 per cent in Scotland, the North and Wales would be damaging enough for the Tories. But if Gallup is right, the swing to Labour is even greater in the Midlands and London, and that 22% swing in the South would put Labour ahead there for the first time in history. And the South has the richest pickings for Labour in terms of seats that can be captured. Just look how the history of Labour failure in the South under leaders like Wilson, Callaghan and Kinnock would be transformed if Labour's support were to stay as high as this. 17 times as many Labour MPs in the South as there were in 1992. That, of course, is if you believe the polls. And there's one more note of caution for Labour from tonight's polls. NOP in the Sunday Times asked people what summed up their view of Labour. 27% said the party would change Britain for the better. But nearly half, 46%, said they weren't enthusiastic about Labour. It was just that Labour couldn't be worse than the Tories. 18% said Labour would make things worse. So, Mr Blair may have the numbers on his side right now, but these figures suggest he and his party have failed to inspire more than one voter in four, Michael. Peter, thanks. A reminder of tonight's main news, the Grand National was abandoned after two coded bomb warnings from the IRA. The huge crowd was ordered off the course. Thousands of people may have to spend tonight in emergency accommodation because their cars and buses are still inside the security cordon. We are evacuating the county stand. There's been some sort of uh, alert. Please evacuate the whole race course and make your way to the centre course and coach park areas. There have been two coded bomb warnings received by the, the police and there is no possibility of taking any chances. You could have just seen the scenes down the stable yard where we've had to leave our horses yeah you know they just said you've got to leave your horses get out of here it's the biggest race in the world um it's very upsetting for everybody that's a disaster that's all from the bbc newsroom tonight from rob peter and me good night <laughs>